Thank you to everyone for being here on this uh, nice weekend day. And, and I do appreciate being invited to be part of the summer reading program. Reading takes you everywhere, so thank you. The library is one of the, my favorite pl places in the city, so I'm really happy to be part of this and, and honored to be part of this, so thank you. Um, so most of my time in Livermore has been as a science teacher. I've been a science teacher for 10 years here, nine of those years at Christensen Middle School, public middle school in Springtown, and one year at Granada, and now it's my fourth year working as um, a teacher on special assignments supporting science and engineering teachers. And nice to see people in the program here. Thank you, and the volunteers for the science program too. Thank you. Um, so my role is to bring projects and programs to both, to both students and teachers. So um, students do, if you have questions or ideas about how, how could you get involved with this, let me know as we go along. So thank you for people who were helping me um, as you came in, who, who put you to work for a little bit. Um, help me with the purpose of the presentation. So some of the things I'd like to accomplish today, to take you to the Arctic, but at least a very small part of this. The Arctic is a huge area, and I was on the north slope of Alaska, so a very small area. Um, but to describe why science research is being done there, and how, why should we care? The Arctic is very far away. How does it impact us here in California? And, and really, why should we care about that, more beyond just going and looking at this beautiful place? How are we connected to the Arctic? So I hope to get those uh, ideas um, passed today. So as you came in, what I asked you to do is to describe some words you think of when you hear the word Arctic. And let's see, I have cold, frigid, far north, surviving extremes, penguins, frostbite, and disappearing, cold, lonely bears, oh, that sounds sad. Disappearance of ice, shrinking, no polar bears, narwhals, I like that one. Um, cold, very few people, clean air, lots of animals, cold, ice, snow, lots of light, penguins, cold, and I think there's some over here, thank you. Um, good, and then things like owls and lakes too. So good, good ideas. Sometimes when I ask people that question, what I hear is um, a cold, barren wasteland. In one class I asked a question to, that was the only words the students used, cold, white, barren. And so I hope that you'll change, if that was in your mind, I hope you change that concept today. Um, I also asked, where would you find these places? In the Arctic, Antarctica, or both? Because these extreme places, um, are so far away and so few people get to, there's some misconceptions of what you find when you go there. Um, I was asked, my, my dentist was saying, oh, you're going to the Arctic. You're going down here, right? No, I went to the north. So um, that, and that's a common misconception. And so thank you, Mary and friend, for correctly identifying where the Arctic and Antarctica is, are, because not everyone does that. That's OK. Um, so let's see where these different things are found. So in the Arctic, in the north, eight different countries lay claim to the Arctic. And that's important. So if we're looking at the, at the image of the globe from a polar point of view, the world looks very different. So here we are, here's Northern California, we're about here in the bay, but this is the whole, the circumpolar region. Eight different countries have uh, a claim there. Um, polar bears are found in the Arctic, not Antarctica. Robins, tundra, flowers are only found in the Arctic. Whales, owls, so thank you for the snowy owls, you're right about that. Um, but robins, I was so excited when I was going to northern Alaska because I thought, oh, I'll see bald eagles, I'll see these, these birds I don't see here in Livermore. The first bird I saw was a robin. <laughs> you were probably in my yard over the winter, and here you are in northern Alaska. So that was kind of disappointing, but kind of fun at the same time. Antarctica is a continent for peace and scientific research by treaty. So many different countries are there also, but they have a contract, they have a treaty to operate peacefully um, for the purpose of doing science research. So the same idea, many countries in both places but with, with different intents. 
Penguins are only found in Antarctica, and it's the driest, coldest, windiest place on Earth. But despite that, there are year-round science research centers in both places. So maybe some of you will go out and work in one of those places. Um, there are volcanoes in both places, fish, glaciers, lakes. In Antarctica, the lakes might be frozen over, but people can cut through that and dive and look for uh, evidence of past lives. Um, and evidence of climate change in both areas also. And that drives a lot of the research. Okay, so to explain to you where I, where I was four years ago going on my trip, started in the Bay Area, took a flight to Seattle, a flight to Anchorage, then a flight to Fairbanks. So I was flying um, one whole day. From Fairbanks, got on a truck and drove up the Dalton Highway to the north slope of Alaska uh, at Tulik Field Station. This was an eight hour drive. So for kids, that's longer than you're in school. We were in this truck going up a um, highway. And here in Livermore, when we think of highway, we often think of 580. We have five lanes of traffic, traffic all the time, very busy. Here's the Dalton Highway. It's a two-lane road. Most of it is gravel. When you travel on the road, you need to have a, we have a CB radio because when you're going up through the mountains and through the passes, you have to get on the radio and say, hey, we're, we're coming up. We're going northbound. So if there's a haul truck coming down, they know to watch out for oncoming traffic. Or if you're in the fog, that's a safety measure, even in the summer. So again, we drove for eight hours. After Fairbanks, there was no stop sign, no traffic light, no free, no uh, shopping center, no schools. This was the scenery. It was beautiful, but very, very, very remote. We drove through the uh, boreal forest in Taiga, and so it's a blurry picture because it was taken from the truck. Um, but the trees are mostly conifers, and you can see they, they look like they're living in a very harsh place, and they are. But this is the last area north where you can see a forest. We went past that, past the place where tall trees grow. And this is the largest biome on the planet, aside from oceans. So very, very unique place. But as we're driving up the Dalton Highway, um, there's, there's no medical or emergency area or rest stops the entire highway. So for eight hours, if something happened, you're on your own. We pass through, we pass by um, two park entrances and pass by some uh, stations that maintain the Alaska oil pipeline. But again, no shopping centers, no schools, we went through one town, halfway up, and it's called Coldfoot. Coldfoot has a population of 10. There are more than 10 people in this room, and that's the population of the town. So again, a very, very remote area, but very, very beautiful. And as people were sitting down, I heard it seemed like some of you are planning to go to Alaska and some of this area. So if you drive here, it's, it's incredible. Um, you need to be prepared. The reason I traveled, though, uh, to the north, to the north slope was through a program called Polar Trek, and Polar Trek is sponsored by the National Science Foundation and the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States, or ARCUS. And so I was very fortunate to be one of 12 people, 12 teachers uh, chosen that year to go on a polar uh, expedition. And some teachers go to the Arctic regions, and some go to the Antarctic region. Um, and I was in the Arctic. Um, there are people on the um, on expeditions now, and so if you're interested, you can uh, log on and you can take my card. The, the uh, website is listed on my on my card there, but you can connect with the teachers in the area and the researchers and follow their expeditions and ask questions of them. And that's part partly why teachers are there to help make that uh, make sense of of the research going on. So please check out Polar Trail.
to train for my Polar Trek adventure, uh, the teachers were brought to Fairbanks in February, mid-February. I arrived, it was minus 27. We uh, walked to dinner, because you don't drive around too much and when it's that cold. So to go outside and dip down to minus 30, I had on 13 different layers of clothes. So it really was, and I needed the mob, still kind of chilly. Um, walking around outside, had a scarf on my nose and all bundled up. Um, I learned quickly I couldn't wear my glasses because the first time I went out, my glasses froze from condensation from my scarf and I couldn't see out my glasses. And they stayed frozen for about a minute. It's just so cold. We had um, bubbles, like bubbles that you play with in the summer, and they froze. You just put bubbles in the air and they froze. We'd get a, a, a mug of hot water and throw it in the air and it was ice before it came down. So it was a, a very unique experience. Um, I was glad to, to feel that cold, but I don't want to live there. Um, people, though, do live in that extreme environment in, in Fairbanks, and they were on their bikes, and even though it was you know maybe minus 20, minus 15, they're out on their bikes commuting, just happy to be outside. But the bikes are really geared up for the snow, big fat tires, no knobby tires. Um, there's kind of like oven mitts on the handlebars, so you can put your hands in and keep warm as you as you uh, riding along. But I was I was surprised to see bikes, but I could understand you want to try to get out and, and get some exercise. So this is the North Slope of Alaska in June. Um, I traveled mid June to early July, and it was just beautiful. Still could see some snow on the hill. The ice, the lake was um, had ice on it that melted by the time we were done. Um, just a beautiful area. Um, Tulik is a uh, research station where people from around the world, scientists from around the world, come and do various projects. They look at bird migration, they look at ecology, at plants, um, ecosystems, carbon release. So a wide variety of science goes on there. Up on the upper right, this was my home for the three weeks I was here. Uh, I was very happy to have a bed. I didn't know what to expect, but I was just really happy to have a whole mattress when we got there. And, um, had a dresser and shared the room with a couple roommates. Um, you know, but we had suitable and, and comfortable living quarters, and then there are uh, several different science labs um, on the camp. So really well equipped science labs, because again, some people were there uh, to do their research. So again, I was there in June. What time do you think this picture was taken? Two in the morning, that's a good guess. It was midnight. So, going above the Arctic Circle, driving up that high, that far north, means that you pass the point where there's at least one day where the sun does not set in the summer, or the sun does not come above the horizon in the winter. That's that imaginary line marking the Arctic Circle. And so I was, uh, in Alaska in the summer, I never saw the sunset. And it was just so incredible. The sky was a beautiful shade of blue. But I never saw the sun go down. And it was funny, you know, being in the, in the lab, in this indoor station, working, and you'd be working till 10 or 11 at night, and coming out and you'd be working and tired, do, just working, came out into the sunshine and felt energized. So a um, really unique place. I really love the light. Um, I had to sleep with an eye mask on, so if you're traveling to Alaska in the summer, I really do recommend an eye mask. I didn't think I'd need one, um, and tried to sleep without an eye mask, and then I woke up thinking I was late for work because the light was so bright, but it was 3 in the morning. Um, but it, that, you know, pack went up. Did you have any trouble uh, or confusion? Because here, when you look and you see the sun, you can kind of use the sun as a guide to tell which way is north, but up there it sort of makes a circle during the day, doesn't it? it I, I knew which way was north because I could see the north slope, which was south oh, of the zero. location. Okay. So I had an idea of which place where north was. Um, not so much time of day. You know, I'm sure if I were there all the time, I would kind of get an idea of where the sun was to gauge the time of day. Um, but. You know, not, not as much. 
That's a good question, though. Okay. Can I ask you a similar question? Yeah, please do. Um, a variation of that. So, so how does the sun go across the sky? I mean, does it start out low and go overhead and come back down but not set and then start it back up again? Or, or does it circle around you like a... Or what, what exactly have, does the sun do when you're up that high? Yeah, you know, I'm going to have to, I'm gonna have to like, remember what that would look like. And you can, you can look at... Uh, you can look at a video of the sun coming back in Fairbanks, and it's just just kind of like come, it just comes up, barely creeps up, and moves around the sky and down. I, I think that that's and kind I, of what I've heard is it goes up a little bit, comes down, but doesn't set, and then just starts back up again, and it keeps doing that. It never went below the horizon. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Good question, though. So, so yeah. it exits to your left, it comes back in the morning on your right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that makes sense. Well, yeah. But where does it go in between? Well, but it's, it's not as big as it's here. It's 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 so far north. Yeah. Well, I just came back from a trip up into Norway, past way past the Arctic Circle, and we never saw the sun because it was cloudy the whole time. But I saw I saw what happens from postcards, and they would, they had a postcard, and on this postcard they had pictures of the sun from starting, say, at noon, and the next one was maybe four hours later, and then four hours later. Anyway, the last picture, you, you were back to noon, and you just saw the sun kind of going up and down like that, and uh, we never experienced I got up a couple times at 3.30 in the morning to see where the sun was, walked around the ship, but it's just light everywhere. You don't know where the sun is, it's just like a fluorescent bulb because it was foggy and cloudy. <coughs> But uh, it just goes around, and I never got to experience that because we had fog and clouds the whole chain fog days were up there. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad you didn't lose the clouds, though. That must have been kind of disappointing, but thank yeah, you for adding that. Yeah, it's kind of hard to describe, and I know I'm not doing a good job at that, but thank you. Um, so if, if there's so many people from around the world going to the polar regions, why? Why are people studying the, the polar regions? And it's because climate change is happening most quickly in both the Arctic and Ant Antarctica. Um, so that's driving the research and driving people to study these areas. And those changes are impact, causing impact globally. And so even though we're far away from the Arctic, changes in the Arctic affect us. And, and many Arctic scientists like to say, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. It's not like Las Vegas, it doesn't stay there. So surface temperatures um, are a good example of the change. And surface temperatures in the Arctic are changing, are rising twice as quickly as the rest of the globe. And this is a uh, data image from NASA in uh, January, a temperature anomalies or changes from the average. And you can see the dark parts are where they're up to five degrees difference than what you would typically expect that that's all across that northern hemisphere. And then down into California, right? Down into the western, uh, northern, North America, the, the uh, temperatures are going up. So we can definitely feel that. One of the um, consequences of that, though, is that rising temperature is causing the Arctic sea ice to melt. And so this, the sea ice or the polar ice cap, where we can kind of think of as North Pole, um, typically would expand along this yellow line, is the typical extent of the ice cap. And at the end of September, kind of the end of summer, uh, this image is, is reissued as the um, minimum ice cap. So that's a take satellite images of, of the ice cap all the time, but September is a big marker. How low did the ice cap go? And in 2016, it was the sixth lowest ever recorded. To give you an idea of the extent, the ice cap used to be cover as much area as the contiguous United States, except for Arizona. And then 2012, the ice cap would be about the size of the states shown in the lighter color in white. So that much other part has, has melted white. You know, but again, it's far away. Why does it matter to us? Some of you did put down lots, lots of the bears and things, but you know, why does that matter to us? What's really important is that ice cap acts as a reflector. 
And so when you park today, you might have put a sunscreen in your car to keep the sun and heat out of your car, or you might go back and wish that you had, so that the ice cap has been acting the same way as a reflector for the planet. And so as that's going away, there's more solar energy being absorbed by the ocean and the land rather than being sent back into the atmosphere. And that's one of the biggest impacts on the loss of the ice cap. And so with that loss of reflection, the water temperatures are warming, the ice is melting further, so it's kind of a, a continual uh, clockwork, a uh, con continual cycle. The land is also, the Arctic's also staying warmer than in the uh, fall and winter, so we're seeing a lot of different temperature change changes because that ice is not there to cool it off. Again, why does that matter to us? There's a lot of impacts with the, with the change of that ice, um, the ice going down. Um, you know, if you mentioned a cruise, you soon will be able to take a cruise all the way across the North Pole because it will be ice free at some point. You probably could do that now. But uh, there's a lot of tourist implications here, a lot of travel implications, uh, because that land will be open. It won't be a solid sheet of ice anymore. There are natural resources there, so it might be more access to natural resources. Russia here has already planted a flag at the bottom of the North Pole or something to try to lay claim to that area where once you couldn't go. Um, so that's going to lead to different policy um, and international relations issues too. So if you grow up and you go into government, this might be something you're working on. Right? Um, changes the indigenous areas, the, the, the way of life of people that for uh, centuries, thousands of years. Um, a book on the current 14-day list that I'll put back into circulation after this, The Right to Be Cold, um, talks about um, the indigenous peoples and how the Arctic has changed in this woman's lifetime. And it's a really interesting story of how she had this traditional way of life and her family had a traditional way of life. And she's about my age, um, but how many changes she has seen over the years. So again, I'll put this back out. But if you're interested in that, a, a really fascinating uh, story. Um, you know, that impacts sea level rise. So a lot of different things are happening because that ice is going away. And this is kind of an important right now. That warming polar region is changing weather patterns. And for us, kind of not so, so bad. Except, that, you know, if you have friends on the East Coast, they've been complaining they've had really, really hot weather. The jet stream, that band of cold, of fast moving air, about six kilometers up, moves about 100, 200 miles an hour, um, and drives weather patterns, is slowing down. That the jet stream forms because of that cold air in the Arctic and the warmer air in the tropics, that difference. And so with that difference, that would, as those cold and warm airs get together, um, it would cause the jet stream. But because that warm north air is not as cold, the jet stream is slowing down. And so that's causing weather patterns to shift and kind of stall. And so the extended heat waves on the east coast and then right now in the UK are because the, the jet stream is slowing down. It's not pushing that heat out and, and big high pressure ridges are forming, which that's about as deep as I can go. But um, you know, if you know meteorologists, get some more information. But the hot air is coming up from the tropics. And so for us, um, a few years ago, we had that ridiculously high ridge, ridiculously stubborn. There was another R in there. But it, you know, I think it kind of goes back to that idea that um, the heat, the pattern, weather patterns kind of stay that way. And then also, um, the cold in the, in the winter has been hitting the East Coast the same type of thing. That Arctic air, remember the Arctic is getting warmer in the winter, that cold air is coming down and really socking the East Coast. So, um, the Washington, D.C. area, things have had record cold. We have been, you know, we've been okay. So, uh, that is still related to climate change. So one of the other areas of research in the Arctic, and if you go to Alaska, um, you'll probably be on permafrost at some point. Um, so permafrost is permanently frozen soil. 
and it is found throughout the Arctic. Hundreds of thousands of acres of permafrost there. That's also a focus of research because that's starting to thaw out with the heat. So one of the things I had to do for the research was to get a temperature of the soil. So I put a temperature probe down into the active layer of soil, the top layer, and it went down three centimeters, half a, about half an inch, less than half an inch, and then hit kind of icy soil. Wouldn't go down anymore. So that's what the, the area is like. That most of the land has, has this frozen bottom to it. But that's changing. Um, the permafrost also stores a lot of organic matter. This is a picture of the Arctic tundra. And I, I love showing these pictures because there's so much life. Again, when people will say, oh, it's a, a white wasteland, there's so many flowers blooming. Because again, there's sunlight all the time. There's a lot of uh, water because the snow has melted, a lot of microbes. So there's a beautiful, beautiful wildflowers. But in the past, there also were a lot of living things. Um, you can see if this is from Fairbanks in the permafrost tunnel, which is dug about a mile uh, horizontally into the permafrost. And you can see what's stored down there. There's some bones, 14,000 year old bones sticking out, uh, twigs and roots. But you know that's what's in the soil. So as that soil is thawing, is warming and thawing, the carbon that's stored is, is becoming exposed. And we're hearing stories in the, in the paper about the uh, Arctic changing and releasing carbon, and that's the source for it. Um, this week, the story came out of uh, Russian scientists who researched part of the um, permafrost in Russia, pulled, pulled up a section of it, and thawed that out and found roundworms that came back to life after they had been frozen for 40,000 years, these worms came back to life, which is so bizarre. And that just story is just, uh, was on the news just this week. Um, it was published in May in a Russian journal. But it kind of makes you, makes you wonder, what's, what's, what else is there? That's kind of unique. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of water in Alaska. So again, if you're traveling there, especially north, the ground's very wet you have permafrost, but you have a lot of snow melt, so that water stays at the top. And kind of, and I was in boots most of the time, or high water boots, um, just kind of sloshing around, because there's, there's a lot of water, so it's, it's kind of interesting. That leads to the mosquitoes. And um, again, more research. My researcher I worked with looked at carbon dioxide release, release from the atmosphere, into the atmosphere from the, from the uh, Frost. So for the um, students in the room, though, the point I want to make is that the people who were there, even though it was a geochemist doing this research, people who were here were in biology, um, had engineering, had computer science experience, um, had geology experience. You never know what you're going to do because these people who are working in geology went back to the lab and took the DNA of the microbes in the soil. So for the students, get lots of experiences, because you, you never know what you can contribute, and that's kind of important. Um, you know, a lot of workers are there too. You need cooks, mechanics, a lot of different areas to work in these, um, in these extreme, area, extreme regions. Another thing that I, I could see in the Arctic is how plants and animals adapted to Arctic and, uh, conditions and to the extreme weather again. On the tundra, there are plants called tussock plants. And because of the permafrost, the plant's roots can't go deep into the soil. It's very shallow soil, so the plant grows up. Basically, grows above the, uh, above the soil. And so again, walking around is a challenge. So you have to walk and then kind of step over these and it's marshy soil. Um, but it's, again, kind of fun. And you can see there's some uh, animal burrows in the plants too. So things have adapted really well. And again, a lot of plants, but they've adapted and not grown so high. Plants grow, there's, 
We have a lot of plants because of the sunshine, but here's a rhododendron, and maybe have a rhododendron in your yard. Um, this is as big as my water bottle, which would be about, it's about as big as this. And that's a full-size rhododendron bush. And then in California, uh, rhododendrons are taller than I am. So you, the, you can notice the plants, and they're, they really adapted differently. But there are a lot of plants, and that's fun to see. Some of the same plants we see here. Um, there's caribou that will travel through the Arctic. Their range is kind of changing, but I was lucky to see the caribou, and lucky to see muskox, a prehistoric looking creature there. And if you look closely, the there's a baby in the center, and the adults have kind of formed a circle around it. So, um, what happened here, some of you are planning to go up north and, and go to, the, to Alaska. Maybe some of you will go in the future. Um, a beautiful, beautiful area, such a wide expanse. I saw a very tiny part of it. And, I, and again, I was far north. I wasn't um, in Alaska where cruise ships and things go. But it's a very beautiful, spectacular place. Yes? So did you see wildlife when you were traveling on the Dalton Highway heading up there? Was there wildlife? This is what we saw. We okay. saw we we went from Tulip, we went to Dead Horse, which was at the end of the Dalton Highway, right at the Barren Sea. It's about 100 miles north. We drove there one time, and um, that's where we saw the caribou and the musk ox, just coincidentally. Um, the area is so big. We, you know, the chief, we were lucky to see them because the, 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 the expanses are so big. We didn't see bears at all. Um, I know I heard there was a bear in camp this year, but there hadn't been grizzly bears for a long time before that. I never saw an eagle. I had hoped to see eagles. You know, I just I had see all this stuff, but it's just so big. But then further south, and you know, I know people who were further south and saw bears all the time. So in moose, in Fairbanks, I saw moose. And you didn't see any eagles in Fairbanks? No. 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 Mm -hmm. I wasn't there very, in very nice, very long, no. But again, if you live there, you know, you can see more. We were close to the pipeline. Yes, we drove past the pipeline right, the whole time. I have a, a slide I can go past and see it. It's, yeah, it goes up. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll find that. I'll, I'll zip through, because this is pretty much the end, almost the end. Um, so I know I've talked some about climate change, put my climate change message here. But, you know, but that's important because that's a reason to care about the Arctic and, and what happens in the Arctic does affect us, especially with weather pattern shifting. Um, so what can we do is stay informed about the area, um, learn about our local ecosystems so you can apply what you've learned um, locally to globally, work to decrease your carbon footprint, and read. So, reading <laughs> takes you everywhere. So the, the library is gracious enough to both thank you, Paul, for copying some uh, book lists here. I asked teachers who were in Polar Trek and uh, teachers and research in the Polar Educators International Program for book recommendations. And there's a long list on the uh, book list up here, so feel free to take one, um, plus books that are on the library's uh, shelves, and those are marked off. Um, but uh, please do check some of these books out. There's some student books here too, so all ages from picture books to research books. Um, you can check out the Polar Trek website. Again, uh, there'll be researchers, there are teachers and researchers in the field now, but you can connect with them. And there are some that are, might be in southern Alaska that if that's a place you're headed to, you can get more of an idea or look at past. Um, expeditions to places that you might be going to or interested in going to you can find out what it's like yes did you see the northern lights no because the sky never the lights never went up oh. the sun never went down no i was disappointed um and, and then in fair when i was in fairbanks i didn't see them either it was cloudy and they, they weren't there but never saw a star and that's that's what's weird oh here here's there's the pipeline and I put this picture up, but we pretty much drove uh, running along the Dalton Highway so that you have access to the pipeline. The entire north-south Alaska 
um, the pipelines there. So it's quite a structure. Really, uh, really impressive to see. Yes? What did you learn about the falling permafrost? I mean, um, when I read about it, it's a huge problem, mm -hmm. both for locals but also for the rest of the world. Did you learn anything? So the, the researcher, and then I'll ask, ask get to your question, Mary. Um, the researcher that I worked with, uh, Rose Corey in Michigan, is found out that as the permafrost thaws, the stored carbon is going into the watershed. And there's so much water, the carbon is, is going into the soil, the active soil in the water, and bacteria in the water, and then um, helped by sunlight, is causing that carbon to convert to CO2. And so that CO2 is being released both into the atmosphere and into the uh, watershed, into the systems. So um, that that was she she has paper, a paper in Nature on that, and that was a, a kind of a groundbreaking thing to prove that. And it's definitely something that that's happening. But that so the heat and the sunlight exacerbate that problem. Um, there's so much stored carbon and stored methane that that's just getting released and exposed and released. Good question. Very good question. Yeah, well, we were concerned, but we heard that they're doing oil drilling in the Alaska Wildlife Refuge, that that's a proposed thing. And it's one thing we fought against in the 80s was because it's where the caribou herd go and have their babies. Right. And the Native Americans up there that live on the caribou herd, and they're called the witching people. And so we had school children writing letters, you know, back then. I was wondering, what can we do now because of this oil drilling? Yeah, that, that's a good point. I think you know a lot of that is staying informed and doing work that you do very well of keeping people active and informed and um, participating and voting and that you know that's that policy that comes back to. So you know I, I, I think that's the message. It's such a big open area. I think a lot of people think well, one little incident's not going to hurt anything because gee, there's so much land here. Um, but, but there are impacts, what happens there does impact the rest of us. But I think you're right to, keep, to stay aware of that, not just, you know, not ignore that. Yes? Would you say more about the clothing that you had to wear? So let's see, I think I have some other. I have a lot of pictures here, so I just kind of skip through. Um, if you were in Antarctica, there's a set of clothing in the back, and you guys can try, anyone can try it on there. You don't have to be looking to try it on. Um, so in Antarctica, you get a big red, do you want a good model? Maybe hold some things up to you. You can just hold them up for me, thanks. Um, a big, big red parka. Um, guys, why red? Why would you wear a red coat? Visibility. Visibility, that's right. If you're out on the ice, or you're in a blizzard, you need to be seen. So a uh, big red parka. Um, you get mittens, and again, you can try that on later if you like. So big furry mittens. Did you need those in Arctic or further? No. No. Um, in the summer, let me see if that pictures. Um, I think I put some on. In the summer, I had on, well, you can see people had on water things. Um, I was issued, and maybe they don't have them. Nope. Um, I was issued rain pants, um, boots, like water boots, like wading boots, um, because of the wet, um, a fleece jacket, a down jacket, and then a bug net. And so um, I wore the down. A couple nights I slept in the down and um, wore the bug net, and you really didn't need it <laughs> most days. Um, it, but it was pretty comfortable. You know, we had rain a couple days fog, but it was not cold in the summer. It was probably in the 50s and 60s to maybe 30s at night. I know this past uh, June they had snow go through. <laughs> Um, so you, you never, here you go. 
inside of the bunny boot and it has about an inch and a half of wolf felt in there to keep you warm. So why, why mittens and not gloves? Why do you think you're working? Why why guys why do you think you have mittens and not gloves? Yeah. What do you think? Because the gloves I want to see the boot. Can I see But you what you get the but you get the mittens. Why why mittens though? You think you get gloves. <laughs> yeah, so you're warmer, right? Your fingers are together and you're warmer. Hang on, so you get and they get this nice fur. So if you're in the hole, you can wipe your nose and warm your nose. <laughs> There's, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's heavy. Um, yeah. So you can tie it on. I'd like to go ahead. Okay, is your research also in the Antarctic? Yes. Yes. The same number um, of countries involved. I love it. I don't know this. I don't know, know by number. Uh, the U.S., Australia, Italy, Russia, um, England, England, France. yeah, England, France. What about Japan? Portugal, China. Japan, and China. Japan and China. Japan and China have, and Korea, South Korea, um, have uh, um, a lot of Arctic expeditions. Um, I was at the Polar 2018 meeting in. Davos, Switzerland in June, and the Asian countries had a large representation. So they stopped killing all the whales and getting the stuff from the whales and the dolphins? They didn't talk about that. They didn't talk about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that should have been brought up. Because they did yeah. a lot of that off the coast. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if they, I, you know, I, I don't know if that was what they were talking about right now. I, I think that's in their back of their mind. I think there's a fast. Yes, why? Was there a reason for your boots to be white? Those boots to be white? That's a good question. I don't know. I think that they do make they do make um, those same boots in black. Because I, I know uh, someone saying, yeah, that their boots were, she likes her black.